Disclaimer. The following audiobook presentation of Jacques Vallée's Passport to Magonia is intended for educational and informational purposes only. This is a non-commercial project by DisinfoZone aimed at disseminating this seminal work to a new audience interested in ufology. We assert that this falls under fair use under United States copyright law, serving the public interest without affecting the market for the original work. We highly recommend purchasing a copy of this book, as well as other works by Jacques Vallée, to support his invaluable contributions to the field. Visuals in this presentation are produced by Static Void Studio, to whom we are deeply indebted. Nurslings of Immortality they are fairies, he that speaks to them shall die. I'll wink and couch, no man their works must I. William Shakespeare, The Merry Wives of Windsor. They speak all the languages of the earth. They know all about the past and future of the human race of any human being. This statement was made in 1968 by a Spanish clerk who claims he has been in contact with extraterrestrials since 1954. The inhabitants of planet Wolf 424 are among us in human form and with false identities. They are far superior to us and very peace-loving. I am in permanent contact with them. They either write to me or call me. We have meetings. How did he contact these superior entities? It seems that in 1954, a saucer threw a stone covered with hieroglyphics into the University Gardens, Madrid. Fernando Sesma copied the symbols down and soon two-way communication began. In Great Britain also, fantastic rumours are spreading. British scientists, some people claim, have been contacted by a mysterious source through radio and have become involved in undercover activities at the request of extraterrestrials. Some of these scientists have disappeared. Through such contacts, so the story goes, the extraterrestrials hope to control our history. For what purpose? I myself have received letters from individuals claiming to be members of secret organizations whose headquarters are, quite literally, out of this world. These correspondents inform me that the purpose of these groups is to prevent mankind from reaching other worlds in space. Of course, other con tactics make exactly opposite claims. The fact remains, however, that belief in non-human control of terrestrial destinies is as old as politics. Thus, a Madrid newsman, Armando Puente, claims that Sesma warned him three months before Robert Kennedy was assassinated that the senator would be killed. Sesma similarly predicted the wave of UFO sightings in Argentina, a much easier task. Moreover, the same power attributed to saucer people, namely that of influencing human events, was once the exclusive property of fairies. This was true in the beliefs of ignorant medieval peasants and of the scholars as well. Thus, one of the first questions put to Joan of Arc by her inquisitors was, if she had any knowledge, or if she had not assisted at the assemblies held at the Fountain of the Fairies near Domremy, around which dance malignant spirits. And another question and answer was thus recorded. Asked whether she did not believe, prior to the present day that fairies were malignant spirits, she answered she did not know. To pursue this line further would involve reopening the entire problem of witchcraft, which is obviously beyond the purpose of this book. It is important, however, to note the continuum of beliefs, for the continuum leads directly from primitive magic, through mystical experience, the fairy faith and religion, to modem flying sources. The study of witchcraft has shown these subjects to be closely interrelated, and from the point of view of modern psychiatry, they must be treated together. And while we are not concerned with individual beliefs in this chapter, we are interested in the social implications of such rumours, which have seldom been faced by the students of the phenomenon. In the Soviet Union, not so long ago, a leading plasma physicist died in strange circumstances. He was thrown under a Moscow subway train by a mentally deranged woman. It is noteworthy that she claimed a voice from space had given her orders to kill that particular man, orders she could not resist. Soviet criminologists, I have been reliably informed, are worried by the increase of such cases in recent years. Madmen rushing through the streets because they think the Martians arc after them have always been commonplace. But the current wave of mental unbalance that can be specifically tied to the rise and development of the contactee myth is an aspect of the UFO problem that must be considered with special care. 
It was to be hoped that the recent scientific investigations of the UFO phenomenon would have treated this problem with the attention it deserved. Unfortunately, they have not done so. This leads me to offer in the present chapter all the information I can provide on this matter, with the hope that sociologists will tackle the problem with more than passing amusement. Of course, some details relevant to this aspect of the UFO phenomenon cannot be published. This docs not mean, however, that they should remain the exclusive property of a few bureaucrats concerned only with the preservation of their peace of mind and the stability of their administrations. To let UFO speculation grow unchecked would only make the public an easy and defenseless prey to charlatans of all kind. It would mean that any organized group bent upon the destruction of our society could undermine it by skillful use of the saucer mythology. They could take us to Magonia with the blessing of all the rationalists. A great sign in heaven. Knock is a tiny village in the west of Ireland. But something took place there on August 21st, 1879, something no student of the human mind should ignore. The weather had been growing steadily worse all day long. At 7 p.m. rain was pouring down on the village as Archdeacon Kavanagh returned home. Mary McLaughlin, his housekeeper, lighted a good turf fire and then at 8.30 went out to visit her friend, Mrs. Margaret Byrne. As she passed the church, she noticed several strange figures in a field and something like an altar with a white light. But she dismissed the sight from her mind and continued on her way. Rain was still falling heavily and she was not tempted to investigate, although she did find the matter very strange. Two other parishioners had seen the figures before her and had reacted in similar fashion. Later on, when it was still not yet dark and as rain continued to fall, Mary McLaughlin went back past the church, accompanied by Mrs. Bairn. At one point, between the church building and the two women, lay an uncut meadow, and in the meadow on top of the grass, three persons appeared to be standing, surrounded by an extraordinarily bright light, and forming such a sight as you never saw in your life. The central figure was Our Lady, that on her right was St. Joseph. The third one was identified by Mary Byrne as St. John the Evangelist, because it resembled very much a statue of the saint she had seen in another village, except that now he wore a mitre. A few minutes later, 18 parishioners were assembled before the apparitions. When a diocesan commission investigated the phenomenon, 14 witnesses, three men, two children, three teenagers and six women, with ages between 6 and 75, described what they had seen. Another man of some 60 years who lived half a mile from Knock also came before the commission to tell of the large globe of golden light he had seen on the night of August 21st. He had been walking in his fields about 9 o'clock and saw this great light covering the whole gable of Knock Church. At the time, he thought that someone had been foolish enough to make a fire in the grounds of the church. Next day, when he inquired of neighbors if they had seen the brilliant light which was stationary over the church for so long a period the previous night, he was told of the apparition. What did these 14 people see? Most striking of all was the light, golden and sparkling, as bright as that of the sun, that was shining on the south gable of the church. It was a changing light, Sometimes it illuminated the sky above and beyond the church. Sometimes it subsided before becoming again brighter and whiter so that the gable seemed like a wall of snow. Within the lighted area, everyone saw the apparitions. The three figures were clothed in dazzling white, silver-like garments. Behind them was an altar with a large cross. In front of the cross was a young lamb face to the west. Quote, Our Lady's robe, strikingly white, was covered by a large white cloak that fastened at the throat and fell in ample folds to her ankles. On her head was a brilliant crown surmounted with glittering crosses and over the forehead where the crown fitted the brow was a beautiful rose. She held her hands extended apart and upward in a position that none of the witnesses could have previously seen in any statue or picture." End quote. Three witnesses reported noticing her bare feet. One woman, Bridget Trench, was so carried away by the sight that she fervently went to the apparitions to embrace the Virgin's feet, but her arms closed on empty air. Quote, I felt nothing in the embrace but the wall, yet the figures appeared so full and so lifelike and so life-size that I could not understand it, 
and wondered why my hands could not feel what was so plain and distinct to my sight. End quote. Bridget also remarked how heavily the rain was then falling, but she added, quote, I felt the ground carefully with my hands, and it was perfectly dry. The wind was blowing from the south, right against the gable, but no rain fell on that portion of the gable where the figures were. End quote. St. John was standing at an angle to the other figures. Dressed as a bishop, he was holding a large open book in his left hand. The fingers of his right hand were raised in a gesture of teaching. One of the witnesses, Patrick Hill, went close enough to see the lines and letters in the book. When the parish priest was told of the apparitions, he said it might be a reflection from the stained glass windows of the church and quietly spent the rest of the evening at home. The phenomenon lasted several hours. Their clothes soaked through, all the witnesses went home before midnight. The next morning, nothing was left to be seen. Ten days after the incident, a deaf child was cured and a man born blind saw after his pilgrimage to knock. Soon seven or eight cures a week were reported. Quote, a dying man, so ill that he vomited blood most of the way while being carried to knock and received the last sacraments from the archdeacon on his arrival, was cured instantaneously after drinking some water in which a scrap of cement from the gable wall had been dissolved, end quote. All this came at an unfortunate time for the Catholic Church in Ireland. Most of Archdeacon Kavanaugh's fellow priests doubted and disapproved. The Knock Church had been built only 50 years earlier, when Irish Catholics had emerged from hiding. And much as in Lords in the early days, the clergy tried not to get involved in the pilgrimages. Local and national papers were asked by the clergy to refrain from giving the apparition publicity, while some papers hostile to Catholicism printed derisive articles about it. Attempts to explain the phenomenon by physical means were made. A science professor from Maynooth performed tests for the official commission of inquiry appointed by the Archbishop of Tuam. He used a magic lantern to project photographic images on the gable wall in the presence of 20 priests and testified that the tests ruled out the possibility that the apparition had been a product of a photographic hoax. A correspondent of the London Daily Telegraph made his own tests at a later date and reported that, however the reported apparitions were caused, they could not have been due to a magic lantern. It is not irreverent to point out that many features in this report are identical to those in UFO phenomena. The strange globe of light of varying intensity, the luminous entities within or close to the light, the absence of rain at the site of the apparition, and finally, the alleged miraculous cures. All these features are present in the current UFO mythology in America. To those who have not closely followed the specialized UFO literature in the last few years, the assertion that UFO sightings involve mysterious cures will come as a surprise. They will find several cases in the appendix. For instance, the Damon, Texas, report of September 3rd, 1965, where a policeman was allegedly cured of a wound on his hand when exposed to the light from a hovering object, case 694. Or the Petropolis, Brazil, report of October 25, 1957, in which we are told that a girl dying from cancer was saved by a fantastic operation performed by two men who came from the sky, case 415. Clearly, we are dealing here with a pattern reminiscent of medieval mysticism. The Knock case is not the most remarkable instance of a similarity between religious apparitions and UFO sightings, and although it took place in Ireland, the miracle aspect is not the most reminiscent of the standard features of the fairy faith. An incident occurring at daybreak, on Saturday, December 9, 1531 in Mexico, however, does represent the culmination of all the superstitions we have discussed. Of tremendous sociological and psychological impact, it has left physical traces that can still be seen and indeed are still an object of much devotion today. On that long ago morning, a 57-year-old Aztec Indian whose Nahuatl name was Singing Eagle and whose Spanish name was Juan Diego was going to the church of Tlaltelolco near Mexico City. Suddenly he froze in his tracks as he heard a concert of singing birds, sharp and sweet. The air was bitterly cold. No bird in its right mind would sing at such hour and yet the harmonious music went on, stopping abruptly. Then someone with a woman's voice called Juan Diego's name. The voice was coming from the top of the hill, which was hidden in a frosty mist, a brightening cloud. And when he climbed the hill, he saw her. 
The sun wasn't above the horizon, yet Juan saw her as if against the sun because of the golden beams that rayed her person from head to feet. She was a young Mexican girl about 14 years old and wonderfully beautiful. So far, we have a perfect beginning for a standard fairy apparition, but in the ensuing dialogue, Juan Diego was told that the girl was Mary and that she desired a temple at that particular place. So run now to Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, and tell the Lord Bishop all that you have seen and heard. This was easier to say than to accomplish. Poor Indians were not in the habit of going to the Spanish section of the city, and even less to the Bishop's palace. Bravely, however, Juan ran down the mountain and begged Don Fray Juan de Zumarraga to hear his story. Naturally, the Bishop, although he was kind to the Indian, did not believe a word of his tale. So Juan went back through the mountains and met the lady a second time. He advised her to send the bishop a more suitable messenger, and he was quite frank about it. Listen, little son, was the answer. There are many I could send, but you are the one I have chosen for this task. So, tomorrow morning, go back to the bishop, tell him it is the Virgin Mary who sends you, and repeat to him my great desire for a church in this place. The next morning, Juan Diego returned to Mexico City and met again with the patient bishop. Juan Diego was so adamant and seemed so honest in telling his story that Fray Juan de Zumarraga was shaken. He told Juan to ask the apparition for a tangible sign, and he instructed two servants to follow the Indian and watch his actions. They tracked him through the city, observed that he spoke to no one, saw him climb the hills, and then he vanished. They searched the area without finding a trace of him the perfect fairy tale. But Juan had gone to the hill. He gave the apparition the bishop's answer and she said, Very well, little son. Come back tomorrow at daybreak. I will give you a sign for him. You have taken much trouble on my account and I shall reward you for it. Go in peace and rest. The next morning, Juan did not come. His uncle, his only relative, was dying. Juan spent the day trying to relieve his sufferings and left him only on Tuesday to get a priest. As he was running to Tlaltelolco, however, the apparition again barred his way. Embarrassed, he told her why he had not followed her instructions, and she said, My little son, do not be distressed and afraid. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Your uncle will not die at this time. This very moment his health is restored. There is no reason now for the errand you set out on, and you can peacefully attend to mine. Go up to the top of the hill, cut the flowers that are growing there, and bring them to me. There were no flowers on the top of the hill, as Juan Diego knew very well. In the middle of December, there could be no flower there, and yet upon reaching the place, he found Castilian roses, their petals wet with dew. He cut them, and using his long Indian cape, his tina, to protect them from the bitter cold, carried them back to the apparition. She arranged the flowers he had dropped in the wrap, then tied the lower corners of the tina behind his neck so that none of the roses would fall. She advised him not to let anybody but the bishop see the sign she had given him and then disappeared. Juan Diego never met her again. At the bishop's palace, several servants made fun of the Indian visionary. They pushed him around and tried to snatch the flowers, but when they observed how the roses seemed to dissolve when they reached for them, they were astonished and let him go. Juan was taken once more to the bishop. Juan Diego put up both hands and untied the corners of crude cloth behind his neck. The looped-up fold of the tilma fell. The flowers he thought were the precious sign tumbled out and lay in an untidy heap on the floor. Alas for the virgin's careful arrangement. But Juan's confusion over this mishap was nothing to what he felt immediately after it. Inside of seconds, the bishop had risen from his chair and was kneeling at Juan's feet, and inside of a minute, all the other persons in the room had surged forward and were also kneeling. The bishop was kneeling before Juan's tilma, and as Ethel Cook Elliot remarks, millions of people have knelt before it since, for it has been placed over the high altar in the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. The tilma consists of two pieces, woven of maguey fibers and sewn together and measuring 66 by 41 inches. On this coarse material, whose color is that of unbleached linen, a lovely figure can be seen, 56 inches tall. Surrounded by golden rays, it emerges as from a shell of light, clear-cut and lovely in every detail of line and color. The head is bent slightly and very gracefully to the right, just avoiding the long seam. 
The eyes look downward, but the pupils are visible. This gives an unearthly impression of lovingness and lovableness. The mantle that covers the head and falls to the feet is greenish blue with a border of purest gold and scattered through with golden stars. The tunic is rose-colored, patterned with a lace-like design of golden flowers. Below is a crescent moon, and beneath it appear the head and arms of a cherub. In the six years that followed the incident, over eight million Indians were baptized. In recent times, some 1,500 persons kneel before Juan Diego's tilma, still intact with the image's radiant colors, every day. Juan's uncle was cured. As he was awaiting the priest, too weak even to drink the medicine his nephew had prepared, he saw his room suddenly filled with soft light. A luminous figure, that of a young woman, appeared near him. She told him he would get well and informed him of Juan Diego's mission. She also said, Call me and call my image Santa Maria de Guadalupe, or so the message was understood. But was this the intended meaning? Following the research of Helen Behrens, Ethel Cook, Eliot suggests that the Indian word used by the apparition was Tetelcote Laxapea, which could be transcribed phonetically as De Guatlachupe. To Spanish ears, this would naturally sound like De Guadalupe. But the apparition spoke the same Indian dialect as Juan Diego and his uncle. She even looked like a young Indian girl, and she had no reason to use the Spanish term ascribed to her. Tetelcote Laxapea means stone serpent trodden on. Helen Behrens assumes that the apparition was thus announcing that she had supplanted Quetzalcoatl, whom the Indians had idolized as a feathered serpent. This impressive story contains a magnificent symbolism. Not only does it bring us back, through the stone serpent, to the Maya monuments we discussed at the beginning of this book, but it also reminds us, in several important aspects, of the many tales of fairies we have reviewed the mysterious sweet music announcing that the fairy draws near, the flower's roses once again that grow in an impossible place, and the sign given to the human messenger, which changes nature as he goes away, like the coals given to human midwives by the gnomes that change to gold, the numerous similar symbols found in countless tales, and finally the cosmic symbolism, the crescent moon under the virgin's feet as in the lines of Revelation. And there appeared a great sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Look, but do not touch. It was a very great wonder, a sign in heaven indeed, the marvellous airship that flew over the United States in the spring of 1897. And the rediscovery of the remarkable wave of reports it generated has provided a crucial missing link between the apparitions of older days and modern saucer stories. On Donald Hanlon's map reproduced with the photographs, all the airship reports have been plotted, with a special sign to denote landings. This map perhaps gives a measure both of the volume of data the students of American folklore have been missing and of the amount of work done in the last three years by researchers such as Hanlon, Jerome Clark, and Lucius Farish. The result of their investigations is astonishing. In California in November 1896, hundreds of residents of the San Francisco area saw a large elongated dark object, which carried brilliant searchlights and was capable of flying against the wind. Between January and March 1897, it vanished entirely and suddenly a staggering number of observations of an identical object were made in the Midwest. Earlier in the book, we have seen how Alexander Hamilton described it, a craft with turbine wheels and a glass section with strange beings aboard looking down, a description not unlike that given by Barney Hill. In March, an object of even stranger appearance was seen by Robert Hibbard, a farmer living 15 miles north of Sioux City, Iowa. Hibbard not only saw the airship, but an anchor hanging from a rope attached to the mysterious craft caught his clothes and dragged him several dozen feet until he fell back to earth. To present in an orderly fashion all the accounts of that period would itself take a book. My object here is only to review the most detailed observations of the behavior of the airship's occupants on the ground. But first, how did the object itself behave? It maneuvered very much in the way UFOs are said to maneuver, except that airships were never seen flying in formation or performing aerial dances. Usually, an airship flew rather slowly and majestically. Of course, such an object in 1897 ran no risk of being pursued. 
except in a few close proximity cases when it was reported to depart as a shot out of a gun. Another difference from modern UFOs lies in the fact that its leisurely trajectory often took it over large urban areas. Omaha, Milwaukee, Chicago and other cities were thus visited. Each time, large crowds gathered to watch the object. Otherwise, the airship exhibited all the typical activities of UFOs, hovering, dropping probes, on Newton, Iowa, on April 10th, for example, changing course abruptly, changing altitude at great speed, circling, landing and taking off, sweeping the countryside with powerful light beams. The occupants of the airship were as variously described as our UFO operators. Several reports could be interpreted to mean that dwarves were among them, but it was not, to my present knowledge at least, stated in so many words by witnesses. Alexander Hamilton says that the beings were the strangest he had ever seen, and that he did not care to see them again. I am not aware of any detailed portrait of the creatures by the witnesses in the Leroy case. They were hideous people. Two men, a woman and three children jabbering together. All the operators who engaged in discussions with human witnesses were indistinguishable from the average American population of the time. This, for instance, is the experience related by Captain James Hooten, described in the Arkansas Gazette as the well-known Iron Mountain Railroad conductor. Quote, I had gone down to Texarkana to bring back a special, and knowing that I would have some eight to ten hours to spend in Texarkana, I went to Holman, Arkansas to do a little hunting. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon when I reached that place. The sport was good, and before I knew it, it was after six o'clock when I started to make my way back towards the railroad station. As I was tramping through the bush, my attention was attracted by a familiar sound, a sound for all the world, like the working of an air pump on a locomotive. I went at once in the direction of the sound, and there in an open space of some five or six acres, I saw the object making the noise. To say that I was astonished would but feebly express my feelings. I decided at once that this was the famous airship seen by so many people about the country. There was a medium-sized looking man aboard and I noticed that he was wearing smoked glasses. He was tinkering around what seemed to be the back end of the ship and as I approached, I was too dumbfounded to speak. He looked at me in surprise and said, Good day, sir. Good day. I asked, Is this the airship? And he replied, Yes, sir whereupon three or four other men came out of what was apparently the keel of the ship. A close examination showed that the keel was divided into two parts, terminating in front like the sharp edge of a knife-like edge, while the side of the ship bulged gradually toward the middle and then receded. There were three large wheels upon each side made of some bending metal and arranged so that they became concave as they moved forward. I beg your pardon, sir. I said, the noise sounds a great deal like a Westinghouse air break. Perhaps it does, my friend. We are using condensed air and aeroplanes, but you will know more later on. Already, sir, someone called out, when the party all disappeared below. I observed that just in front of each wheel, a two-inch tube began to spurt air on the wheels, and they commenced revolving. The ship gradually arose with a hissing sound. The aeroplane suddenly sprang forward, turning their sharp end skyward. Then the rudders at the end of the ship began to veer to one side and the wheels revolved so fast that one could scarcely see the blades. In less time than it takes to tell you, the ship had gone out of sight." End quote. Captain Hooten adds that he could discover no bell or bell rope about the ship and was greatly shocked by this detail, since he thought every well-regulated air locomotive should have one. He left a detailed drawing of the machine, we next look at the testimony of Constable Sumter and Deputy Sheriff McLemore of Hot Springs, Arkansas. Quote, while riding northwest. From this city on the night of May 6, 1897, we noticed a brilliant light high in the heavens. Suddenly it disappeared and we said nothing about it, as we were looking for parties and did not want to make any noise. After riding four or five miles around through the hills, we again saw the light, which now appeared to be much nearer the earth. We stopped our horses and watched it coming down, until all at once it disappeared behind another hill. We rode on about half a mile further when our horses refused to go further. About a hundred yards distant we saw two persons moving around with lights, drawing our Winchesters, for we were now thoroughly aroused to the importance of the situation. 
We demanded, who is that and what are you doing? A man with a long dark beard came forth with a lantern in his hand and on being informed who we were proceeded to tell us that he and the others, a young man and a woman, were traveling through the country in an airship. We could plainly distinguish the outlines of the vessel, which was cigar shaped and about 60 feet long and looking just like the cuts that have appeared in the papers recently. It was dark and raining and the young man was filling a big sack with water about 30 yards away and the woman was particular to keep back in the dark. She was holding an umbrella over her head. The man with the whiskers invited us to take a ride, saying that he could take us where it was not raining. We told him we believed we preferred to get wet. Asking the man why the brilliant light was turned on and off so much, he replied that the light was so powerful that it consumed a great deal of his motive power. He said he would like to stop off in hot springs for a few days and take the hot baths, but his time was limited and he could not. He said they were going to wind up at Nashville, Tenor, after thoroughly seeing the country. Being in a hurry, we left, and upon our return, about 40 minutes later, nothing was to be seen. We did not hear or see the airship when it departed. End quote. In the Chicago Chronicle of April 13, 1897, appeared the following under the headline, Airship Seen in Iowa. Quote Fontanelle, Iowa, April 12th. The airship was seen here at 8.30 tonight and was viewed by the whole population. It came from the southeast and was not over 200 feet above the treetops and moved very slowly, not to exceed 10 miles an hour. The machine could be plainly seen and is described as being 60 feet in length and the vibration of the wings could be plainly seen. It carried the usual colored lights and the working of the machinery could be heard as also could the strains of music as from an orchestra. It was hailed but passed on to the north, seeming to increase its speed and disappeared. There is no doubt in Fontenelle that it was the real thing and is testified to by the most prominent citizens, etc." End quote. Here the airship, which had appeared to Captain Hooten as a typically mechanical contraption, takes on a more fairy-like appearance. The parallel becomes even more striking in the following report, as pointed out by Hanlon, it is extracted from the April 28th edition of the Houston Daily Post. Quote, Merkel, Texas, April 26th. Some parties returning from church last night noticed a heavy object dragging along with a rope attached. They followed it until in crossing the railroad, it caught on a rail. On looking up, they saw what they supposed was the airship. It was not near enough to get an idea of the dimensions. A light could be seen protruding from several windows, one bright light in front like the headlight of a locomotive. After some ten minutes, a man was seen descending the rope. He came near enough to be plainly seen. He wore a light blue sailor suit and was small in size. He stopped when he discovered parties at the anchor and cut the rope below him and sailed off in a northeast direction. The anchor is now on exhibition at the blacksmith shop of Elliot and Miller and is attracting the attention of hundreds of people. End quote. This sounds much too familiar to be taken lightly, comments Hanlon, who reminds his readers of the Sioux City incident, when Robert Hibbard was dragged by an anchor hanging from an airship, and of Drake's and Wilkins's account of two incidents that took place about 1211 AD or earlier, according to the Irish story. Quote, there happened in the borough of Cloera one Sunday, while the people were at Mass, a marvel. In this town is a church dedicated to St. Canaris. It befell that an anchor was dropped from the sky with a rope attached to it and one of the flukes caught in the arch above the church door. The people rushed out of the church and saw in the sky a ship with men on board floating before the anchor cable and they saw a man leap overboard and jump down to the anchor as if to release it. He looked as if he were swimming in water. The folk rushed up and tried to seize him but the bishop forbade the people to hold the man for it might kill him, he said. The man was freed and hurried up to the ship, where the crew cut the rope and the ship sailed out of sight. But the anchor is in the church and has been there ever since as a testimony." End quote. In Gervais of Tilbury's Otis Imperialia, the same account is related as having taken place in Gravesend, Kent, England. An anchor from a cloud ship became fastened in a mound of stones in the churchyard. The people heard voices from above and the rope was moved as if to free the anchor to no avail. A man was then seen to slide down the rope and cut it. 
In one account, he then climbed back aboard the ship. In another, he died of suffocation. The Houston Post of April 22, 1897, has a further report. Quote, Rockland, Mr. John M. Barclay, living near this place, reports that last night about 11 o'clock, after having retired, he heard his dog barking furiously, together with a whining noise. He went to the door to ascertain the trouble and saw something, he says, that made his eyes bulge out. And but for the fact that he had been reading of an airship that was supposed to have been in or over Texas, he would have taken to the woods. It was a peculiar shaped body, with an oblong shape, with wings and side attachments of various sizes and shapes. There were brilliant lights, which appeared much brighter than electric lights. When he first saw it, it seemed perfectly stationary, about five yards from the ground. It circled a few times and gradually descended to the ground in a pasture adjacent to his house. He took his Winchester and went down to investigate. As soon as the ship, or whatever it might be, alighted, the lights went out. The night was bright enough for a man to be distinguished several yards, and when within about thirty yards of the ship, he was met by an ordinary mortal, who requested him to lay his gun aside as no harm was intended. Whereupon the following conversation ensued. Mr. Barclay inquired, Who are you and what do you want? Never mind about my name, call it Smith. I want some lubricating oil and a couple of cold chisels if you can get them, and some bluestone. I suppose the sawmill hard by has the two former articles, and the telegraph operator has the bluestone. Here is a ten dollar bill. Take it and get us these articles, and keep the change for your trouble. Mr. Barclay said, What have you got down there? Let me go and see it. He who wanted to be called Smith said, No, we cannot permit you to approach any nearer but do as we request you and your kindness will be appreciated, and we will call you some future day and reciprocate your kindness by taking you on a trip. Mr. Barclay went and procured the oil and cold chisels, but could not get the bluestone. They had no change, and Mr. Barclay tendered him the $10 bill, but same was refused. The man shook hands with him and thanked him cordially and asked that he not follow him to the vessel. As he left, Mr. Barclay called him and asked him where he was from and where he was going. He replied, from anywhere, but we will be in Greece day after tomorrow. He got on board when there was again the whirling noise and the thing was gone, as Mr. Barclay expresses it, like a shot out of a gun. Mr. Barclay is perfectly reliable, end quote. The same night, half an hour later, according to the Houston Post of April 26th, and reported independently. Quote Josserand, Considerable excitement prevails at this writing in this usually quiet village of Josserand, caused by a visit of the noted airship, which has been at so many points of late. Mr. Frank Nichols, a prominent farmer living about two miles east of here, and a man of unquestioned veracity, was awakened night before last near the hour of twelve by a whirring noise similar to that made by machinery. Upon looking out, he was startled upon beholding brilliant lights streaming from a ponderous vessel of strange proportions which rested upon the ground in his cornfield. Having read the dispatches, published in the post of the noted aerial navigators, the truth at once flashed over him that he was one of the fortunate ones, and with all the bravery of Priam at the siege of Troy, Mr. Nichols started out to investigate. Before reaching the strange midnight visitor, he was accosted by two men with buckets who asked permission to draw water from his well. Thinking he might be entertaining heavenly visitors instead of earthly mortals, permission was readily granted. Mr. Nichols was kindly invited to accompany them to the ship. He conversed freely with the crew, composed of six or eight individuals about the ship. The machinery was so complicated that in his short interview he could gain no knowledge of its workings. However, one of the crew told him the problem of aerial navigation had been solved. The ship or car is built of a newly discovered material that has the property of self-sustenance in the air, and the motive power is highly condensed electricity. He was informed that five of these ships were built at a small town in Iowa. Soon the invention will be given to the public. An immense stock company is now being formed, and within the next year the machines will be in general use. Mr. Nichols lives at Josserand, Trinity County, Texas, and will convince any incredulous one by showing the place where the ship rested." End quote. In the Flying Saucer Review, Jerome Clark observes that, 
1897 wave indicates the futility of any attempt to divorce flying objects from the general situation in which they operate. This makes the study of such objects infinitely broader than the simple investigation, in scientific terms, of a new phenomenon. For if the appearance and behaviour of the objects are functions of our interpretation at any particular time in the development of our culture, then what chances can we have of ever knowing the truth? In Chalet, Dordogne, France, on October 4, 1954, Mr. Garot, a man who is regarded as trustworthy by local residents, saw a round flying object, the size of a small truck, shaped somewhat like a cauldron. It landed in his field and a door slid open. Two normal men in brown coveralls came out. They looked like Europeans and shook hands with Garot. Then they asked, Paris? North? The poor farmer was so taken aback that he did not answer. The two men stroked his dog and flew away. On October 20th, that same year, a 40-year-old Czech worker who lives in France was going to work at 3 a.m. near Rand l'Etape, Vosges, when a quarter of a mile from his house he met a heavy-set man of medium height wearing a grey jacket with insignias on the shoulders and a motorcyclist's helmet and carrying a gun. The stranger spoke an unknown language. The witness, Lazio Udvari, knew some Russian and tried that language. The man, who spoke in a high-pitched voice, understood him at once and asked, where am I? In Italy? In Spain? Then he wanted to know how far he was from the German border and what time it was. Ujvari told him it was about 2.30, and the man pulled out a watch which said 4 o'clock. The visitor then told the witness to move along. Soon, Udvari came into view of a craft that had apparently landed on the road. It was shaped like two saucers glued together, about five feet in diameter and three feet high. Udvari came within 30 feet of it, but the unknown individual told him to move away, and soon he saw the object rise vertically, with the noise of a sewing machine. October 12th, 1954. At about 10.30 p.m. at saint marie de herblay on the Atlantic coast of France, 13-year-old Gilbert Lelay was walking around outside, about half a mile away from his parents' home, when he saw, in a pasture, a machine he describes as a phosphorescent cigar. Close to the object was a man wearing a grey suit, boots and a grey hat. In a familiar gesture, the man put his hand on Gilbert's shoulder and told him in French, Look but don't touch. In his other hand, the man held a sphere from which purple rays were emitted. Shortly thereafter, he climbed aboard the craft and shut the door with a clapping sound. Gilbert had time to see something like a control console with numerous coloured lights on it. The craft arose vertically, made a couple of loops while throwing light in all directions, and vanished. A foggy morning, June 1968, Argentina. An artist, 70-year-old Benjamin Solari Paravicini, was walking outside when he was confronted by a tall, blonde man with clear eyes, who addressed him in an unknown language. Thinking he was some insane character, the witness went on his way, but then he lost consciousness. He woke up inside a strange craft, where he was told, among other things, that the saucer people were keeping watch on the earth to avoid a catastrophe. July 18, 1967, Boardman, Ohio. Reverend Anthony DiPolo was awakened by a strong sound similar to the background music of a science fiction television show. He thought that someone was telling him to go downstairs. He did so and looked outside. There, between his house and the next one, he saw a figure wearing a luminous suit. DiPolo went outside. The sound started again. Then he received the message. You have nothing to fear. I shall not hurt you, and I know you will not harm me. DiPolo came closer. The sound started again, and he received a third message. Danger. I must leave. DiPolo saw a light, or rather a kind of glow in the sky. When he lowered his eyes, the strange entity had vanished. March 23, 1966, Temple, Oklahoma. Wee Laxon, 57, a civilian instructor with the U.S. Air Force, was driving south toward Shepard Air Force Base at 5 a.m. when he found the road blocked by a large object, the size of a Douglas C-124 Globemaster without wings or engines, resting on pads. A man dressed in coveralls, with a kind of baseball cap on his head, appeared to be examining something on the underside of the craft. When asked how this man looked, Laxon replied, quote, he was just a plain old GI mechanic, or a crew chief, or whatever he might happen to be on that crew. 
He had a flashlight in his hand and he was almost kneeling on his right knee with his left hand touching the bottom of the fuselage, which was about three feet from the pavement. People wonder if they looked as an outer space deal. I told them I didn't know what an outer space deal looked like, but I do know this was made in America, I am sure. It had a plain old GI in it, I know that much. I would know the man if I saw him in Chicago tomorrow." End quote. On October 18, 1954, at 10.45 p.m., near the lake of Saint-Point, in the east of France, a Miss Bourio saw a bright light on the road and stopped her bicycle. She saw a man, average in size, close to the light. With him were two dwarfs. The functioning lie. What does it all mean? Is it reasonable to draw a parallel between religious apparitions, the fairy faith, the reports of dwarf-like beings with supernatural powers, the airship tales in the United States in the last century, and the present stories of UFO landings? I would strongly argue that it is, for one simple reason. The mechanisms that have generated these various beliefs are identical. Their human context and their effect on humans are constant. And it is my conclusion that the observation of this very deep mechanism is a crucial one. It has little to do with the problem of knowing whether UFOs are physical objects or not. Attempting to understand the meaning, the purpose of the so-called flying saucers, as many people are doing today, is just as futile as was the pursuit of the fairies, if one makes the mistake of confusing appearance and reality. The phenomenon has stable invariant features, some of which we have tried to identify and label clearly. But we have also had to note carefully the chameleon-like character of the secondary attributes of the sightings, the shapes of the objects, the appearances of their occupants, their reported statements, vary as a function of the cultural environment into which they are projected. The airship stories are especially relevant in this connection. As we have seen, a good number of bearded characters alighted in the Midwest and elsewhere in 1897 to request water from a well, bluestones, or other similar things. The stories they told were believable, if somewhat astounding, to American farmers of the time. The airship itself corresponded to the popular concept of an elaborate flying machine. It had wheels, turbines, wings, powerful lights. There is only one detail not yet dealt with. The fact that the airship, though it was believable to the witnesses of 1897, is no longer credible to us. We know very well that the devices described could not possibly fly, unless its outside appearance was designed to deceive potential witnesses. But if so, why? And what was it? What was its purpose? Perhaps the airship, like the fairy tricks, the flying saucers, was a lie, so well engineered that its image in human consciousness could sink very deep indeed and then be forgotten, as UFO landings are forgotten, as the appearance of supernatural beings in the Middle Ages are forgotten. But then, are they really forgotten? Human actions are based on imagination, belief and faith, not on objective observation, as military and political experts know well. Even science, which claims its methods and theories are rationally developed, is really shaped by emotion and fancy, or by fear. And to control human imagination is to shape mankind's collective destiny, provided the source of this control is not identifiable by the public. And indeed, it is one of the objectives of any government's policies to prepare the public for unavoidable changes, or to stimulate its activity in some desirable direction. Thus, the Soviets have skillfully employed the services of science fiction writers to supply the emotional support of their space effort among the young people. In the Western world, control over our imaginations is more diffuse and many sources compete for it. But it is significant that intelligence agencies and advertising companies alike should be so highly interested in folklore. Not only are Batman and the Jolly Green Giant instances of experiments in this direction, the Vietnam War has seen similar appeals to public imagination through the use of local superstition. Recent discussions in Congress regarding the advisability of military experimentation with witchcraft in black Africa is also a case in point. I'm not saying, of course, that the UFO phenomenon is produced by a similar trick, but I do say that, beyond the question of the physical nature of the objects, we should be studying the deeper problem of their impact on our imagination and culture. Whatever they are, a lot of books about them have been written, sold and read. 
how the UFO phenomena will affect in the long run our views about science, about religion, about the exploration of space, it is impossible to measure. But to those who follow the situation closely, the UFO phenomenon does appear to have a real effect. And a peculiar feature of this mechanism is that it affects equally those who believe and those who oppose the reality of the phenomenon in a physical sense. For the time being, the only positive statement we can make, without fear of contradiction, is that it is possible to make large sections of any population believe in the existence of supernatural races, in the possibility of flying machines, in the plurality of inhabited worlds, by exposing them to a few carefully engineered scenes, the details of which are adapted to the culture and superstitions of a particular time and place. Could the meetings with UFO entities be such artificial constructions? Consider their changing character. In the United States, they appear as science fiction monsters. In South America, they are sanguinary and quick to get into a fight. In France, they behave like rational, Cartesian, peace-loving tourists. The Irish gentry, if we believe its spokesman, was an aristocratic race, organized somewhat like a religious military order. The airship pilots were strongly individualistic characters with all the features of the American farmer. Now consider the following case, which I regard as the perfect landing. The date is October 23, 1954, and the place near Tripoli, Libya. About 3 a.m., an Italian farmer saw a flying craft land a few dozen yards from him. It was shaped like an egg laid horizontally. The upper half was transparent and flooded with very white light. The lower half appeared to be metallic. The forepart had two side ports, the central part an external ladder. The hind part had two vertically disposed wheels, one above the other, and two cylindrical protruding tubes. While descending, the craft made a noise similar to that of a compressor, like those used for inflating car tires. No propeller was visible. The fuselage was surmounted by two antennae, one behind the other, and bore a kind of undercarriage with six wheels, two pairs in the fore part of the craft, one pair behind. The machine was about six yards long and three yards wide. Inside it were six men in yellowish coveralls wearing gas masks. One of them took his mask off in order to blow into a sort of tube. His face appeared to be that of a normal human being. When the witness got close to the object and put a hand on the ladder in order to climb it, a strong electric shock threw him to the ground. One of the occupants made gestures as if to warn him for his sake to keep away from the craft. Another occupant pulled out a wheel and again put it back where it formerly was. Then, pushing a button, he caused a kind of half container to cover the wheel. Inside the cockpit, a kind of radio set, complete with wires and operated by a man with earphones, was visible. All six pilots were busy on their instrument panels. The incident lasted about 20 minutes. Then the object silently took off and reached an altitude of 50 yards. Then it went away at a dizzying speed, toward the east. The imprints left by the undercarriage's wheels on the soft ground have been photographed. They resembled those of normal rubber wheels. Their length was only about two feet. If it were possible to make three-dimensional holograms with mass and to project them through time, I would say this is what the farmer saw. And with that theory, we could explain many of the apparitions. In numerous UFO cases, and in some religious miracles, the beings appeared as three-dimensional images whose feet did not actually touch the ground. But what about the other physical actions, such as the electric shocks? As we read the account of the Libyan landing case, it is tempting to assume that the farmer, far from witnessing by chance the maneuvers of interplanetary visitors, was deliberately exposed to a scene designed to be recorded by him and transmitted to us. Hence, the gas masks, the instrument panels, and the radio set, complete with wires. The same is true with the following Italian case, which took place in Abiate Guazzone near Varese on April 24, 1950. Quote, At 10 p.m., Bruno Facchini heard and saw sparks, which he attributed to a storm, but he soon discovered a dark mass hovering between a pole and a tree 200 yards from his house. A man dressed in tight-fitting clothes and wearing a helmet appeared to be making repairs. There were three other figures working around the huge craft. This work being over, a trap through which light had been shining was closed, and the thing took off. 
Other details were as follows. The object made a sound similar to that of a giant beehive, and the air seemed strangely warm around it. Two of the men were standing on the ground near a ladder. The third one was on a telescopic elevator, the base of which touched the ground and was holding something near a group of pipes. This produced the spark seen by Facchini. They were about five feet nine inches tall, dressed in grey diving suits with an oval transparent glass in front of their faces, which were concealed behind grey masks. From the fore portion of the masks, a flexible pipe emerged at the level of the mouth. They wore earphones. Inside the craft could be seen a series of oxygen-type containers and many dials. When Facchini offered his help, the men talked among themselves in guttural sounds, and one of them took a camera-like device from around his neck and projected a beam of light on Facchini, who tumbled away for several yards. He was then caught by a rush of air and thrown again to the ground. They subsequently ignored him as they recovered the elevator and brought it inside the craft, which took off. After a sleepless night, Facchini returned to the site and found some metal fragments left by the soldering operation, also four circular imprints and patches of scorched grass. He revealed the observation only ten days later, when his doctor treated him for the pains and bruises resulting from his fall and advised him to call police. Ministry of Defence technicians who examined the metal samples found them to consist of an anti-friction material very resistant to heat. The incident had other witnesses who testified privately. Had Mr. Facchini been exposed deliberately to a faked apparition of space beings? What could be the purpose of such a worldwide elaborate hoax? Who can afford to contrive such a complex scheme for so little apparent result? Is human imagination alone capable of playing such tricks on itself? Or should we hypothesize that an advanced race somewhere in the universe and sometime in the future has been showing us three-dimensional space operas for the last 2,000 years in an attempt to guide our civilization? If so, they certainly do not deserve our congratulations. Are we dealing instead with a parallel universe, where there are races living, and where we may go at our expense, never to return to the present? Are these races only semi-human, so that in order to maintain contact with us, they need crossbreeding with men and women of our planet? Is this the origin of the many tales and legends where genetics plays a great role? The symbolism of the virgin in occultism and religion, the fairy tales involving human midwives and changelings, the sexual overtones of the flying saucer reports, the biblical stories of intermarriage between the Lord's angels and terrestrial women, whose offspring were giants. From that mysterious universe have objects that can materialize and dematerialize at will been projected. Are the UFOs windows rather than objects? There is nothing to support these assumptions, and yet in view of the historical continuity of the phenomenon, alternatives are hard to find, unless we deny the reality of all the facts, as our peace of mind would indeed prefer. The problem cannot be solved today. If we absolutely must have something to believe, then we should join one of the numerous groups of people who have all the answers. Read Menzel's books or the Condon Report, that fine piece of scientific recklessness, or subscribe to the magazines that prove that flying saucers are real and from outer space. I have not written this book for such people, but for those few who have gone through all this and have graduated to a higher, clearer level of perception of the total meaning of that tenuous dream that underlies the many nightmares of human history, for those who have recognized, within themselves and in others, the delicate levers of imagination and will not be afraid to experiment with them. Conjectures. It may seem useless to conjecture about a phenomenon that, according to all authorities, remains unidentified. But this book has shown that it has left a clear series of marks in the beliefs and attitudes of our contemporaries, in a pattern not only identifiable, but also by no means unprecedented. Hence it is not necessarily pointless to try to devise critical tests, both sociological and physical in nature, to determine whether or not purposeful design is involved in the phenomena the witnesses describe. If the answer is yes, the problem of deducing the identity of the intelligence that generates it is not necessarily a solvable one. This latter fact should therefore be the basis of any future attempt at theoretical interpretation. Whenever a set of unusual circumstances is presented, it is in the nature of the human mind to analyze it until a rational pattern is encountered at some level.
But it is quite conceivable that nature should present us with circumstances so deeply organized that our observational and logical errors would entirely mask the pattern to be identified. To the scientist, there is nothing new here. The history of science consists in dual progress, the refinement of observational techniques and the improvement of analytical methods. On the other hand, the proposition that the universe might contain intelligent creatures exhibiting such an organization that no model of it could be constructed on the basis of currently classified concepts is also theoretically plausible. The behavior of such beings would then necessarily appear random or absurd, or would go undetected, especially if they possessed physical means of retiring at will, beyond the human perceptual range. It is interesting, but only incidental, to observe that such physical actions would appear on scientific records as mere random accidents, easily ascribable to instrumental error or to a variety of natural causes. Considering the UFO phenomenon as a special instance of that more fundamental question, we are presented with the dual possibility of very long-term unsolvability and of continued manifestation. And this is true whether the phenomenon is natural or artificial in nature. This being the case, the development of a new myth feeding upon this duality is entirely predictable. In the absence of a rational solution to the mystery and public interest in the matter being intense, it is quite likely that in the coming years every new brand of charlatanism will use it as a base, although it is not possible to predict its exact form. We may very well be living the early years of a new mythological movement, and it may eventually give our technological age its Olympus, its Fairyland, or its Walhalla, whether we regard such a development as an asset or as a blow to our culture. Because many observations of UFO phenomena appear self-consistent and at the same time irreconcilable with scientific knowledge, a logical vacuum has been created that human imagination tries to fill with its own fantasies. Such situations have been frequently observed in the past, and they have given us both the highest and the basest forms of religious, poetic, and political activity. It is entirely possible that the phenomenon we study here will give rise to similar developments, because its manifestations coincide with a renewal of interest in the human value of technology. There currently is considerable puzzlement among the public, and especially among the young, whenever the attitude of scientists confronted with such phenomena is discussed. Sometimes their questions contain a note of anguish. Typically, they ask the following. How can we react to the flood of absurd, incoherent stories about flying saucers? What is the use of pursuing a study of science if it cannot be applied to the rational analysis of such phenomena? In a time when the young are encouraged to follow with enthusiasm the progress of space exploration, why should the subject of life in the universe be a forbidden topic? Several organizations exist in the United States devoted to the investigation of this problem. They seem to have the support of some reputable scientists, and they often allege that the government is convinced that the phenomena have an intelligent origin, but that it hides the truth from the public. Should we not join such organizations to gain knowledge of the subject? A tentative answer could perhaps be formulated as follows. First, it is a mistake to believe in authority, or to put blind faith in official reports, scientific theses, or the theory of a particular author, whenever a point of research is discussed. As objective as my reader perhaps thinks I am, I cannot help but have a general image in mind as I write this book. And so do all writers, even writers on subjects as amenable to objective analysis as chemistry or geometry, no matter how loudly they deny being biased. Therefore, one must borrow from books only those elements that appear properly documented, and they must be confronted with a larger human context. A good researcher should not be afraid to change his mind. He should not feel desperate, because his comforting beliefs leave him as soon as he begins to think critically. If he applies these rules, he may not solve all the problems he attacks, but at least he will be less likely to fall victim of every delusion or fad that is associated with them. Just as some cheap magazines are deliberately written to generate fear in the public and to capitalize on that fear, some scientific reports arc deliberate hoaxes designed to reinforce the credibility of our scientific, political or military establishments. This is a fact of life, and it should not discourage one from the study of science. It does not necessarily mean that anybody is hiding some formidable truth. 
If the idea that science knows nothing about certain phenomena is unacceptable to the public, why should it be more easily acceptable to professional scientists? Those groups of enthusiasts who advocate a crash study of flying saucers by specially hired scientific consultants forget that a given discipline can make progress only if competent professionals are genuinely and sufficiently interested in it to direct their efforts toward its solution, and this is not done by money alone or by act of Congress. Either there is no scientific value at all in the many UFO observations that have accumulated over the years, in which case no amount of publicity will have any effect on its solution. Or these observations contain scientific pay dirt, in which case that residue will be recognized and exploited by direct research and will result in novel developments that current methods are by definition incapable of predicting. A young researcher should keep in mind that he will never make a serious contribution to the study of this problem or of any problem unless he first develops his own competence to the point where he can select an aspect of it and cover it by himself, without relying on the emotional form of thinking which characterizes the enthusiast. It is precisely because science is the process through which unsolvable emotional arguments can be transformed into organized sets of sub-problems amenable to rational analysis that the UFO phenomenon is interesting. Therefore, to say that UFOs are not a scientific problem, or even to pose the question, is to utter an absurdity. There is no such thing as a scientific problem. It is the man who looks at the problem who is scientific in his approach, or who is not. Science is an object in the mind of man, not a characteristic we are at liberty either to bestow upon or to withdraw from every funny-looking contraption that happens to cross our skies. For a scientist, the only valid question in this context is to decide whether the phenomenon can be studied by itself or whether it is an instance of a deeper problem. This book has attempted to illustrate, and only to illustrate, the latter approach. And the conclusion is that, through the UFO phenomenon, we have the unique opportunity to observe folklore in the making and to gather scientific material at the deepest source of human imagination. We will be the object of much contempt by future students of our civilization if we allow this material to be lost, for tradition is a meteor which, once it falls, cannot be rekindled. The manner in which observations are gathered should be of interest to the sociologist because it exhibits certain amusing features. There is a tendency among the believers to gather into large, very formal organizations where they waste all their energy and sometimes a good deal of money with practically no visible result. It is clear that such organizations answer a psychological need rather than a genuine desire to discover the answer to an interesting intellectual problem. Maintaining such a group implies a tremendous overhead, mailing lists, bookkeeping, etc. And experience shows that research is always the last activity it can afford. Instead, these groups generate so much internal bitterness and so many inter-organizational feuds that they prove to be serious obstacles to independent researchers who are simply trying to get first-hand data and do not care to support one particular personality or theory against another. There are so many such groups now that their publications no longer reach the scientists who can hardly be expected to read 15 or 20 specialized magazines every month. If people really wanted to get at the root of the UFO phenomenon, they should simply constitute a large number of small informal circles, the only objective of which would be the gathering of first-hand reports. It should be obvious that professional scientists are not in a position to do this. They know the problem only through the daily press, which does not give information on reports made outside a small area. When it does, the witness account is so biased that the information becomes worthless. And even if the article is accurate, there is no way to measure the reliability of the witnesses or to learn their standing in the community. Only local residents can evaluate such an odd occurrence as a UFO sighting at its true weight. The creation of a network of active but informal groups would also help solve the problem of documentation and publication. When the main organized groups do conduct investigations, they bury them in their files or publish only biased, heavily edited summaries, thus screwing down the lid on the observational material they precisely set out to reveal. To summarize, neither a crash program staffed with 20 Nobel Prize winners 
nor computer correlations of millions of poorly observed parameters, nor mental telepathy with superior space beings, nor the organization of hundreds of people into observation squads, scanning the heavens every night with binoculars and a pure heart, will easily dispose of a problem that has eluded our radar, aircraft, astronomers and physical theories for so long. The only thing that might help us make some progress toward an understanding of the phenomenon is the publication of good reports. They must be first-hand reports. They must be gathered fast and published fast. They must circulate freely. In the United States, unfortunately, there is not a single serious journal whose columns are open to private researchers for the publication of such investigations. But there are several respected periodicals in other parts of the world, notably the Flying Saucer Review of London, often quoted here, which is becoming a major source of material for the student of folklore. In French, the GEP Bulletin and Lumières dans la Nuit are two sources whose honesty this writer has found indisputable but none of these publications has the answer to the UFO problem. The material for many years of very constructive study lies about us unnoticed. It is only when witnesses come forward with the type of observation discussed in this book that we realize that never in history has the human mind been so productive, so secret and so fascinating. We must finally address ourselves to the question, if we reject the naive theory that the UFO phenomenon is caused by friendly visitors from Mars, what alternatives can we suggest? It is amusing to try to answer this question. Imaginative science fiction buffs could perhaps look into the following lines of speculation. 1. There exists a natural phenomenon whose manifestations border on both the physical and the mental. There is a medium in which human dreams can be implemented, and this is the mechanism by which UFO events are generated, needing no superior intelligence to trigger them. This would explain the fugitivity of UFO manifestations, the alleged contact with friendly occupants, and the fact that the objects appear to keep pace with human technology and to use current symbols. The theory explains the behavior of the visitors. Aggressive in Latin America, Cartesian in France, alien monsters in the United States, etc. It also naturally explains the totality of religious miracles as well as ghosts and other so-called supernatural phenomena. Two, the same result would be obtained if we could hypothesize mental entities, which would be simultaneously perceptible to groups of independent witnesses. Unfortunately, it would stop short of explaining the traces left by such phenomena. Three, we could also imagine that for centuries, some superior intelligence has been projecting into our environment, chosen for reasons best known to that intelligence, various artificial objects, whose creation is a pure form of art. Perhaps it enjoys our puzzlement, or perhaps it is trying to teach us some new concept. Perhaps it is acting in a purely gratuitous effort, and its creations are as impossible for us to understand as is the Picasso sculpture in Chicago to the birds that perch on it. Like Picasso and his art, the great UFO master shapes our culture, but most of us remain unaware of it. Unfortunately, none of these attractive theories has a scientific leg to stand upon. I must apologize for presenting them here, but I only wanted to show how quickly one could be carried into pure fantasy as soon as the hard lesson of the facts was ignored. Clearly, a hundred or a thousand such theories could be enumerated at very little expense and every one of them could serve as the basis for a very nice new myth, religion, or pseudo-scientific fad. If we decide to avoid extreme speculation, but to make certain basic observations from the existing data, five principal facts stand out rather clearly. Fact 1. There has been among the public, in all countries, since the middle of 1946, an extremely active generation of colourful rumours. They center on a considerable number of observations of unknown machines close to the ground in rural areas, the physical traces left by these machines, and their various effects on humans and animals. Fact 2. When the underlying archetypes are extracted from these rumors, the saucer myth is seen to coincide to a remarkable degree with the fairy faith of Celtic countries. The observations of the scholars of past ages and the widespread belief among all peoples concerning entities whose physical and psychological descriptions place them in the same category as the present-day euphonauts. Fact 3. The entities human witnesses report to have seen, heard and touched fall into various biological types. 
Among them are beings of giant stature, men indistinguishable from us, winged creatures, and various types of monsters. Most of the so-called pilots, however, are dwarfs and form two main groups. One, dark, hairy beings, identical to the gnomes of medieval theory, with small, bright eyes and deep, rugged, old voices. And two beings, who answer the description of the sylphs of the Middle Ages or the elves of the fairy faith, with human complexions, oversized heads and silvery voices. All the beings have been described with and without breathing apparatus. Beings of various categories have been reported together. Fact 4. The entity's reported behavior is as consistently absurd as the appearance of their craft is ludicrous. In numerous instances of verbal communication with them, their assertions have been systematically misleading. This is true for all cases on record, from encounters with the gentry in the British Isles to conversations with airship engineers during the 1897 Midwest flap and discussions with the alleged Martians in Europe, North and South America and elsewhere. This absurd behavior has had the effect of keeping professional scientists away from the area where that activity was taking place. It has also served to give the saucer myth its religious and mystical overtones. Fact 5. The mechanism of the apparitions in legendary, historical and modern times is standard and follows the model of religious miracles. Several cases which bear the official stamp of the Catholic Church, Fatima, Guadalupe, etc., are in fact, if one applies the definition strictly, nothing more than UFO phenomena, where the entity has delivered a message having to do with religious beliefs rather than with fertilizers or engineering. Given the above five facts, I believe the following three propositions to be true. Proposition 1. The behavior of non-human visitors to our planet, or the behavior of a superior race coexisting with us on this planet, would not necessarily appear purposeful to a human observer. Scientists who brush aside UFO reports because obviously intelligent visitors would not behave like that, simply have not given serious thought to the problem of non-human intelligence. Observation and deduction agree, in fact, that the organized action of a superior race must appear absurd to the inferior one. That this does not preclude contact and even cohabitation is an obvious fact of daily life on our planet, where humans, animals and insects have interwoven activities in spite of their different levels of nervous system organization. Proposition 2. If we recognize that the structure and nature of time is as much of a puzzle to modern physicists as it was to Reverend Kirk, then it follows that any theory of the universe that does not take our ignorance in this respect into account is bound to remain an academic exercise. In particular, such a theory could never be invoked seriously in a discussion of the constraints placed on possible visitors to our planet. Proposition 3. The entire mystery we are discussing contains all the elements of a myth that could be utilized to serve political or sociological purposes, a fact illustrated by the curious link between the contents of the reports themselves and the progress of human technology, from aerial ships to dirigibles to ghost rockets to flying saucers, a link that has never received a satisfactory interpretation in a sociological framework. With respect to the last point, I find it remarkable that the first instance of a blackout caused by a UFO should be found in Twilight Bar, a play written by Arthur Kessler in 1933. During the play, which takes place on a small unnamed island where a civil war is about to break out, an enormous meteor flies over the town with a high-pitched whistling sound as all the lights go out. The craft plunges into the sea and two beings, dressed in white coveralls and moving as if in a trance, come ashore and introduce themselves as messengers, sent to warn mankind that it has three days in which to mend its ways. Otherwise, the creatures say, mankind will be destroyed and the earth will be repopulated by a superior race. Similarly, I am indebted to Donald Hanlon for pointing out that the first reference to UFO effects on car ignition came in a novel written in 1950 by Bernard Newman and entitled the flying saucer. It is true that when Newman's book was written, some UFO reports involving magnetic disturbances of the compass were circulating. Even in 1944, the military had already amassed considerable information about unidentified flying objects, the first large-scale scientific investigation having been done the previous year. But the fact remains 
that the coincidence between these works of imagination and the actual details of the reports that came from the public is a remarkable one, and it opens the way to unlimited speculation. Unfortunately, this is precisely the point where we must stop speculating. To conclude, let us remark that the density, time-wise, of UFO manifestations is not decreasing. Let us also note that knowledge of the structure of time would imply superior knowledge of destiny. I am using the word destiny to designate not the fate of individuals, but the mechanism through which physical events unfold, and the canvas upon which they are implemented. Perhaps I should remind the reader of two points we have touched upon earlier. One, the relativity of time in Magonia, a theory passed on to us in numerous tales we have reviewed. And two, that astonishing little remark made by a sylph to Facius Carden, which antedates quantum theory by four centuries. He added that God created the universe from moment to moment, so that should he desist for an instant, the world would perish. As Jerome Carden says, be this fact or fable, so it stands. I cannot offer the key to this mystery. I can only repeat, the search may be futile, the solution may lie forever beyond our grasp, the apparent logic of our most elementary deductions may evaporate. Perhaps what we search for is no more than a dream that, becoming part of our lives, never existed in reality. We cannot be sure that we study something real, because we do not know what reality is. We can only be sure that our study will help us understand more, far more, about ourselves. This is not a worthless task, and this idea gives me comfort as I leave you with the lines of Milton. I took it for a fairy vision of some gay creatures of the element that in the colors of the rainbow live and play I the plighted clouds. I was awestruck, and as I passed, I worshipped. If those you seek, it were a journey like the path to heaven to help you find them.